Okay, thanks very much, Eugenia. Welcome everybody to tonight's Expand the Green Belt uh, for Nature and People. We're having a discussion and we're very pleased to have Anastasia here, who is actually not with us as Lintner Law, but rather the Special Project Council for Healthy Great Lakes. So just to be clear on that. And then myself, Janet Sumner, and we have uh, Dave Pierce. I'll give you a brief overview of the agenda that we have to come tonight. I've just finished the welcome. And uh, the purpose for tonight is that we're here talking about a proposal to have a proposal to uh, expand the green belt. But it's actually to, we're hoping that we can get you all excited about it, answer some of your questions and prepare you to uh, create a submission um, to the Ontario government, encouraging them to expand the, the green belt. So that's the purpose of, uh, of why we're here. And as I said, we have Dave Pierce, who are, is our Senior Forest Conservation Manager for Wildlands League, myself, Janet, who is the Executive Director. And we're very fortunate to have with us Anastasia Lintner, who is the Special Project Council for Healthy Great Lakes. And uh, working all the tools and controls and behind the scenes, as you can see, is Eugenia Kwok. She's our, uh, we've got a new title there as well, Engagement and Outreach Manager. And I know that I've screwed up the title, but Eugenia can give us a, bit better on that because it's brand new and it's essentially recognizing all the digital work that she's doing for us now. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Eugenia, who's going to give us a little bit of the housekeeping and how to stay on track so that we can get the best out of this webinar. Eugenia. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Janet. Um, so as Janet mentioned, I'm Eugenia. I'm the Campaign Engagement Manager. <laughs> it's a slightly different title. Um, so just real quick, if you're joining us now, uh, your video and your speaker should be muted. If you're calling in over the phone, please make sure that your microphone is muted just so that we're reducing background noise. Um, each of our speakers tonight will be talking for about 10 minutes and we will have around 15 minutes for questions at the end. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to add them in the Q&A box should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we'll try to address them at the end of this webinar. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Janet. Thanks very much. And I, I was just remarking before we, uh, we went live that everybody gets to see into everybody's home. And you can see Eugenia has this virtual forest behind her. She obviously has a green thumb. And in the background at my place is a, a set of a uh, of uh, birthday balloons. So we've been recently celebrating a birthday here. So that's just a little bit of the, the color that you get to see on Zoom. So um, anyway, I'm going to start with um, a discussion about the context and then we'll be moving over to Anastasia who's going to give us a little bit of a history of how we got here on the green belt and what happened, what's transpired and then where we're going to and potentially um, hopefully what we can look forward to if we can get our, our um, submissions in and actually create the, the impetus for the government to, to move on this. And then Dave's actually going to uh, do a discussion of connectivity, which is um, the piece that is in, of particular interest to us as Wildlands League and thinking through how uh, connectivity, especially in this Southern landscape, really helps build back um, uh, nature. And that's uh, where the green belt comes into play. And then we're going to move to this question and answer as Eugenia mentioned. But I'm going to start with saying that you might want to scan this code using your camera on your phone. And I will actually explain a little bit more about that when I do the context sharing piece. But if you want to grab this right now, and I know that uh, Eugene is also going to share in the chat, I believe, the link to it so you can actually get to it. And it's called a Padlet. And that doesn't mean it's a min mini paddling event, which is what I thought it was, but rather it's a map. And so I'll explain a little bit more about that as, as we go through. So um, uh, just to give you, and I'm gonna take you right out to a global context uh, for nature and why the green belt is important. For us, uh, we all know that uh, the natural world is collapsing. We have a million species that are facing extinction. And what it means when a million species are facing extinction is it means that the ecosystems that support that life, that support all of those systems is actually starting to get, uh, is starting to crumble and it's crumbling because of the the, the weight of the footprint from humanity. And so we have a, a natural uh, ecosystems that are starting to collapse. We have a climate system that's broken. And it's as if we've already ripped the very fabric of the natural world apart. So as we, as we face this, what we can do is actually, it's time to start putting back together. And the very good news is that we have a blueprint on how we can, we can do that. 
And so for us, it's about deploying uh, different strategies in different parts of Canada. And really it works from a, a south, middle and north kind of perspective. And in the south where we live, where we have homes and agriculture and cities, is we need to build nature back. And the reason that we need to build nature back is because nature's been under the most pressure there. We've got um, in Southern Ontario, for example, less than 1% is protected. We have the highest number of biodiversity, but we also have the greatest pressure on biodiversity, creating an ecological hotspot. So we have that strategy for the South is to really start building that back. And we started that conversation by creating the Nature Connectivity Project, which really focuses on how do you actually start to build some corridors and connectivity, and Dave will go through this, but it's also about um, uh, doing things with farmers and um, other effective conservation measures. It's about um, planting trees and restoration and protecting the last remaining intact that we have left. In the middle of Canada is where we have, uh, basically it's a band that goes all the way across Canada and sort of the, roughly the middle, but it's essentially where nature and um, resource extraction are currently coexisting and one can argue whether they're coexisting well or whether or not it is time to actually uh, put some help in there for nature. And so what we need to focus on in that, in that regard is really making sure we have enough uh, nature protected. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, the science is saying that we need up to 50% to make sure that ecosystems are functioning and doing well. I hand a cup of tea. And so it's figuring out how do we actually plan for nature in the middle of Canada and do restoration where we can as well, and maybe build things like uh, ecological corridors and wildlife crossings, et cetera, in the middle. And then in the north, where we have perhaps uh, some of the greatest opportunities, the opportunities here are to get out ahead of the damage that we've created in these other uh, capacities and start to protect some very large areas and really um, what I call protect abundance uh, because we have an opportunity to do so. And that means also right into the marine uh, landscape. These are images from uh, our uh, new marine website and getting out in Ontario where most people don't realize we have a seaside coast. It's a little bit cooler than most people's seaside coast, but the Northern seaside coast is where we have lots of uh, polar bears and where we have belugas uh, swimming in the bay and great big pods of up to 300. And uh, we want to see protection in the North that is on a scale that is commensurate with protecting the abundance of wildlife there. So that's the strategy. And then, um, uh, that, so as I said, it works from a South, Middle and North perspective. And that's how we will actually secure, uh, get to a secure climate and a livable world for all creatures on it. And it, uh, we won't actually secure the climate without doing this strategy. Now to the Padlet. So if you click on the Padlet, and I've got that in here, and I'm just gonna show you how this works. So hopefully it opens up the little, and uh, tell me Eugenia if it uh, changed over to the map. Okay, it didn't. So I'll stop the share and then I will share again. And hopefully you can see it now. Is that, you got the map now? Come yep. Okay, awesome. Okay, so this is a, a new little invention that our uh, Willow team uh, created that Eugenia heads as our campaigns engagement manager. And it is, um, we want everybody to populate this with ideas. And this is ideas, hopefully, that are about expanding the green belt. And you can see we've got one here. We've already put some pieces in here. And the way that this works is uh, you could put it in, you could put an image of it, you can write something about it. And maybe I'll just try to pop this one out so you can see it in, I'll expand it so you can see it. And this just says Rouge Beach. It's a wonderful spot for sunsets and walking the dog. But it also is a, a place where we have a campaign to expand the Rouge uh, National Urban Park. And we'd like to see the Pickering Airport lands added to this. So we're just building this map and there will be more content that we add. But right now, as we're doing this, we're really pleased if you would like to start adding your own pieces of content. You can see uh, here's one about uh, Starkey Hill Conservation Area. Uh, an important nature and recreation trail. Uh, this person has written, you can also like different pieces. You can put a comment in, you can say how you feel about this. And we'd love it if you could add uh, various pieces as we're going and having this conversation. Again, I'll just expand that post so you can see it. It's a little bit about the terracotta conservation area. 
And you see how beautiful that is. And I think, you know, it's almost impossible to go and see all of these areas. But what's great is if we can start to populate a map like this, we'll be able to take a virtual tour and see all the different ways in which we could be adding to the green belt. So that's just some of the examples that you might see on here. And I'll maybe go back to the, um, the presentation. And so that's my tour of the big context and taking us down to a little bit of a working model of the Padlet. Feel free to be adding things as we're doing the, um, the presentation. And let's just see. Yeah, that's, that's it for me. So I'm kicking it over to Anastasia, who's going to do us a little bit of a history tour and take us up to the future and then where we hope to be going. Anastasia. Thank you. I am going to say right off the top that I'm going to go very fast uh, through this journey of how we got to where we are to date. And um, I've done this presentation several times. So if you uh, have heard me say it before, um, you'll know that there are versions of this presentation already on our website, which I'm putting in the chat. You don't need to write it down. You can catch it there. This particular one will be up um, tomorrow. And I wanna just talk about uh, how, what is the green belt? What, is, what happened in the first review of the Greenbelt Plan uh, in 2015, uh, and then what's going on right now. And if you aren't familiar with the Canadian Environmental Association, we are a specialty clinic within a province-wide network of clinics that are funded primarily by Legal Aid Ontario. And we provide a number of services, including representation at courts and tribunals, if you qualify for legal aid, but also we provide policy analysis and public legal education, of which this is an example, helping the communities and our partners and clients and collaborators understand our assessment or analysis of what the laws mean. And uh, as Janet said, my position is Special Projects Council of Healthy Great Lakes. It's funded by the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. And so my focus is on water and uh, wetlands in the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence River and Ottawa River basins. So what is the Green Belt? It's a piece of legislation that uh, does a few things. It defines the Green Belt area. It defines what needs to go into a Green Belt plan and it defines the protected countryside. It also established that there is required to be a provincial plan called the Greenbelt Plan and that there is required to be a Greenbelt Council that advises the provincial government. And it outlines how any uh, actions either have to conform with or not conflict with aspects of the Greenbelt legislation. One of the things that we're talking quite a bit about is the boundary or the Greenbelt area. And the Lieutenant Governor and Council, which I've just termed cabinet, has the authority to make a regulation, which has already been done in 2005, that sets out the Greenbelt area. It can be amended as it has been in 2013 and 2017. And the legislation requires that at a minimum, that Greenbelt area must always contain the Oak Ridges Moraine area and the Niagara Escarpment Plan area, as well as a plan of the boundary of the protected countryside. Now, you may also know that the Oak Ridges Moraine and the Niagara Escarpment each have their own piece of legislation. So this Greenbelt Act does not override those other pieces of the legislation. And that's where the legislation has this sort of you know, they, they are meant to complement each other. And if there's any aspect that seems to be conflicting, the Greenbelt Act says that whatever is more protective of, the, of, the, of these features is the one that's going to be uh, supersede. And the legislation requires that the size of the Greenbelt area cannot be reduced. The legislation requires that there be a Greenbelt plan. And in the plan, there are a number of things 
the primary uh, ways in which there are land use designations are two, that there's this protected, uh, well, the protected countryside contains two primary land use designations, the agricultural system and the natural heritage system. And it describes a, a number of policies about restricting certain types of land uses and in how we're gonna protect those features, our rural livelihoods, our natural uh, systems for biodiversity and our headwaters, for example. Uh, there are um, requirements that certain decisions conform with these, uh, with the policies of the Greenbelt Plan and and actions um, such as municipal public works or municipal bylaws must not conflict with the Greenbelt Plan. The legislation also requires that there is a review of the plan every 10 years and outlines who has to be consulted as well as providing that the public must be given an opportunity to participate. And the Greenbelt Plan uh, can be amended um, as it was in the first review. And uh, given that there was a Greenbelt plan first in 2005, the first 10 year review started in 2015. At the time, um, the government decided that there are four provincial plans uh, of this type that sort of are the, pro the, the way the province le uh, leads or um, talks about the provincial interests in local land use planning the Growth Plan, the Greenbelt Plan, the Oak Ridge Marine Conservation Plan, and the Niagara Escarpment Plan, it was decided that we'd review all of those together. And so there were four different public notices on the environmental registry, there was an advisory panel established, and the four provincial plans were updated in 2017. Now, following on that in late 2017, there was a proposal to study an area to grow the green belt. And um, there was a lot of discussion about that. The consultation period went from December 2017 in, into um, spring of 2018. Uh, our organization and a number of other organizations hosted workshops back in the days when we could get together in person and talk through some of the things that were important to communities around the green belt. And what we have seen now is a decision notice that has been posted uh, that says that that proposal is not going forward anymore, but the things that were submitted are going to be considered as part of this new consultation that started on February 17th. And that brings us to now. The Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing is consulting on ways to grow the size and further enhance the quality of the green belt. And as Janet mentioned, this is just um, a discussion about the ways in which the boundary might be expanded. There will need to be another consultation of the proposed regulation that actually will give uh, effect to expanding the green belt. And the government is asking for um, feedback on two potential priorities, the study area of the Paris Belt Moraine and adding, expanding, protecting urban river valleys. In addition to commenting on those two potential priorities, they've asked some other questions. Are there other potential areas for growing the green belt? How um, would you advise the government to balance or prioritize expansion with other priorities? Uh, that the government has? And then are there other things that should be considered? Uh, you, uh, as a resident of Ontario, you under the Environmental Bill of Rights are guaranteed your right to participate in provincial decision making. Those uh, comments uh, the government is required to consider when making a decision. I would suggest that if you did participate in uh, 2018, that you include or emphasize anything you mentioned then. Uh, to make it easy, like for ease of reference. And then um, it's important to remember that there is going to be more. If the government decides they are going to go ahead and actually expand the green belt, there'll be another uh, public consultation period. And um, if you uh, have questions for me, we'll try and answer some tonight, but if you have questions for me or wanna get in touch, it's anastasia.sela.ca. 
and you can get in touch with us as well on our social media channels. And with that, I'm, do I hand it directly to Dave? Yeah, I was just going to say thank you, Anastasia, and uh, you kept right on time. Uh, we we're just ticking along here. So Dave, you can take it away, please, sir. Okay, great. Thanks, Anastasia. Um, so Janet kind of set the global stage for the issues we're facing and, uh, and mentioned our connectivity project as one sort of example of what we're trying to do at a local level. And we'll drill down even further. Um, so this map kind of shows where we're focused in the in the nature connectivity project and uh, our plan our vision is a connected southern ontario that goes from tobermory at the tip of the bruce peninsula all the way over to uh kawartha highlands provincial park past peterborough and from windsor down in the extreme southwest tropical corner of the country up to algonquin park and right in the middle, you'll see highlighted on this map is the green belt, which um, actually provides some of the benefits we're looking at. The dark green are protected areas like of the highest order, like provincial parks and a couple of national parks, Bruce Peninsula and La Rouge. Uh, but the green belt does provide a lot of protection and a lot of values. And the piece that kind of inspired this connectivity project is uh, a piece of work by Jeff Bowman out of Trent University. And he also works with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And uh, he uh, and his colleague, Chad Cordes, developed a connectivity map. And what this does is it shows how the landscape is either highly conducive to animals moving through it, like in the yellow and the red, or not very conducive and not um, conductive to animals going through and has low connectivity. So the blue are areas of low connectivity, the orange and the red are areas of high connectivity. The red are actually pinch points. So they're very valuable, but they're also constricted areas where animals have a narrow um, corridor of movement uh, to get through. And so an animal like uh, a bobcat, which Jeff has studied coming into Ontario and they actually come across from the Alleghenies across through the Niagara Peninsula and can travel through these corridors. And interestingly, if you look back at the previous map, this one, the green belt actually captures some of that, those areas of high connectivity for animals. And it's no accident that the green belt actually goes up here and on this side of Lake Simcoe and provides connectivity up through towards Algonquin and from the south. What's missing from the green belt, and we'll talk about this later, is this chunk between Lake Simcoe and Georgian Bay that has a lot of high connectivity for Southern Ontario where animals can actually pass through. And so we can talk about that a little bit later, um, what's actually missing. So this map really inspired our connectivity project and that vision to connect and protect and actually restore areas in Southern Ontario. Now we've worked a lot in Northern Ontario. And when I say Northern Ontario, that's past Barrie, past Algonquin Park, as Janet indicated, as far as uh, Hudson Bay and James Bay. And, and we worked on things like caribou, which take a long time to respond um, in a positive way to land being grown back. And so we've got, a, got three tenants. We've got a connectivity tenant, we've got a protection tenant, and we've got a restoration tenant uh, and, uh, and goal for this, this connectivity project. And the restoration is actually, well, there's a lot of problems in the Southern landscape. The restoration piece is something that actually provides a lot of hope because uh, as this kind of indi uh, image indicates, even after a period of uh, as little as 10 years, if you do nothing to a basically a paved surface in an urban area, it's gonna start to grow back in, uh, in vegetation. And as little as, as 10 years, you can get a lot of vegetation back. 
when we're dealing with caribou, we're looking at a minimum of 40, 50, 60, or 80 years before their habitat's gonna come back. In this landscape, especially if you intervene, you can get a lot of, um, of land coming back into, uh, into habitat for animals. Animals like Janet showed a barn owl, um, or uh, in some cases, we have badgers in, in Southern Ontario that do very well with uh, agriculture or um, improved and restored agricultural landscapes. So that restoration piece is not only vital because we've messed up a lot of the landscape, but also can have quite quick uh, results. And of course, the other piece is protection. And the green belt, as we've seen, provides protection and it provides uh, uh, a protection, particularly from urban development and can provide connectivity through this landscape uh, all the way from, as I said, from the Alleghenies up through to the, uh, to the Corthes and beyond to Algonquin Park. And we'd like to see that maintained and enhanced. The opportunity that we have right now, the very, uh, the real opportunity we have uh, to expand the Greenbelt. The proposal proposes, as Anastasia said, two areas, the Paris Galt Moraine over here on the west side of the Greenbelt, and then the urban river valleys. And if we look at, at uh, there's uh, around 20 that have been identified, but there's also smaller um, uh, tributaries and uh, urban valleys that haven't been uh, zeroed in on. Um, and so we don't want to miss out on these. And for example, the moraine is, uh, is an area that uh, we know is highly valuable. Moraines are essentially leftovers from glaciers, bulldozing the landscape and uh, leaving till, as they call it, or debris in their wake. But that debris over the eons has become hills uh, and porous uh, substrate that rainwater and meltwater can percolate through, uh, be purified, becomes aquifers that not only leap out in springs to uh, fuel the headwaters of the creeks and streams and rivers, but also provide drinking water directly through through uh, wells. And this is a case where a moraine, once it's been damaged, once it's been paved over, once it's been heavily, heavily urbanized, it's very hard to restore. So these are areas where we really, really need to focus our protection. And um, luckily, they've in included the Paris Galt moraine in this proposal, which is great. And they've also, as we said, highlighted the urban river valleys. But as Anastasia said, the urban river valleys that are already part of the green belt are only protected um, on the public land portion. And there's a lot of the urban river valleys which are private land. And so if you think of them as connectivity corridors and urban valley, river valleys are valuable for that, um, as they provide a passageway through an urbanized landscape, all this orange is basically built up area. So if an animal like uh, an otter uh, was needing to disperse because of, um, you know, to find mates and extra food down the Rouge River without a, a, a good corridor, they might not be able to set up a new territory uh, in an adjacent stream like, like Duffins Creek, for example if they couldn't get through and there wasn't a, a complete passage through this area. And urban river valleys, as we know, as those of us who live in the city, so I walk from not my neighborhood down to um, a tributary of the Don River, down over here, uh, they're a completely different landscape. They're very, very rich in biodiversity. Um, in my backyard, I see um, robins, cardinals, crows, normal things like that, gray squirrels. But if I just go a few hundred meters into the ravine, we have all those animals plus or 
different species of squirrels, chipmunks, red squirrels, kingfishers, uh, owls. Um, these urban river valleys are remarkably well preserved and could be better preserved under an enhanced and expanded greenbelt. The other thing is the current proposal uh, emphasizes the urban river valleys and we need to be protecting them beyond the urban areas out into the open countryside to really open up that connectivity and, and uh, protection. The other question that Anastasia highlighted, uh, which is in the proposal is, is it enough? Is it enough to protect the Paris Gulf Moraine and some of these additional urban river valleys? Well, as we saw in our connectivity map, there's a huge area between Lake Simcoe and Georgia Bay that isn't part of the green belt that could be, uh, that has tremendous opportunity to improve connectivity up towards uh, Upper Georgian Bay and Algonquin Park through this area. There are at least six additional moraines in addition to the Paris Galt Moraine uh, in, in these areas that should be protected. There are um, residual landforms from uh, ancient glacial lakes, the uh, old Algonquin, Lake Algonquin and Lake Iroquois shorelines and the, and the uh, plains associated with those um, ancient lakes that have unique features that should be protected. And this was all brought out in um, the proposed blue belt that came out of a, a, a partnership of several uh, environmental groups a few years ago uh, under the, the consultation that Anastasia just mentioned. So when you're giving your um, feedback and your, your submissions to this current proposal, I think these are some of the features that uh, we can really, really highlight um, and, and uh, suggest as expansions of the current green belt. I'm just gonna end with this slide. It, uh, it's a, a piece of some of the information that we've been gathering about the green belt, uh, its, its size, its importance, um, its impact on the uh, economy, uh, as well as on biodiversity. And um, I think we'll share this through other means, but there's, if you haven't come across it, um, our take action page is, um, can be accessed um, through this link at the top of the page. So I think I'm just around the 10 minute mark. I'll leave it there and uh, turn it back. Stop my share and turn it back to command and control. Thanks, thanks so much, Dave. Um, so Dave was finishing off there with a, a slide that was letting people know that if you, we would really like for people who have heard this webinar and others, you can also encourage your friends to make submissions to the Ontario government and uh, get as many people in there um, providing their input on how to expand the green belt because it really is, uh, it's a, I don't think we've said this tonight, but it's, I mean, this is, this is uh, like generational. This will transform the areas as we put these areas into the green belt. It will be something that uh, the next generation, the kids in your lives, your, your grandchildren and nieces and nephews and kids will all be able to experience in the green belt. And certainly one of the things that's been highlighted in my life uh, with the advent of uh, COVID is that green space has never been more important than it is right now. And it will continue to be important for people that I think it's regenerative and recuperative powers in addition to the fact that it's a, it's a, a safe environment to go out and be in the green belt. So we're hoping that uh, people will actually go to the um, to the uh, the website that will provide that information if you don't get it in today's chat you haven't been quick enough to get it down with dave's presentation or you didn't capture it uh, we will be sending out an email after the event uh, thanking you for coming and giving you some of the resources so that you can also uh, make submissions uh, we were very very pleased to see that within 24 hours we had 140 people had made uh, fairly substantive submissions into the green belt portal that we've created and we're really hoping that that increases. Um, and maybe Anastasia, you can remind me of the, the deadline for uh, submissions in this round. What is it again? 
Monday, April 19th. That's right. So Monday, April 9th, 14th, which is also budget day for the federal government, but uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a busy day, Monday, April 19th. So make sure you get your submissions provide the information to you through uh, an email. And I'm just going to ask uh, Eugenia if you've had any questions coming in and if we could uh, get to some of those. Sure, yeah. Um, and you, maybe we'll just wait 30 seconds for people to have some time to populate some questions. Um, please feel free to add them to the Q&A box. Um, in the meantime, I know that some uh, people had already submitted some questions. So maybe I could start off with, um, will there be other opportunities um, after this comment period or public consultation period to um, add comments in about this expansion? Oh, Stasia, you can take that one. You're the one with the best intel on that. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, so the <clears throat> technically for the Environmental Bill of Rights, there has to be a deadline and then comments are taken and government looks at them and, and has to consider them and then makes a decision about the next step. In the meantime, keep talking about this. Talk to your MPP, your elected officials locally, the planning staff in your, in your uh, municipalities, talk to your neighbors. Uh, this is something that needs to be an ongoing conversation. And when the government does decide their next step, if the next step is to propose an actual expansion, they will be required to consult again. And if you've got those networks together, then you'll be ready um, to have that kind of dialogue with the provincial government again. And, and I saw there was another question and I know Eugene wants to ask it, but I'm gonna add something to it. So uh, I saw that Neve sent in a question where she was looking for more information about the blue belt. And Dave, I was wondering if you could just even uh, give us a bit of a snapshot of what is the blue belt? We kind of know what a green belt is, but maybe you could explain a little bit about what the blue belt is and then where people can get more information on it. Yeah, we can share, we can share a link on that. So the blue belt is, um, I think um, the focus was on water resources, hence, hence the name. So it was looking at, like, as I said, some of these um, landforms less left behind by the ancient glacial lakes, the, the old lake, lake shores, um, the water resources associated with them um and the moraines particularly the rains moraines so there's there's um six more moraines that i didn't know about um uh outside the paris Gulf moraine and the oak ridges moraine uh that are important parts of this and then the watershed particularly of the nottawa saga river which runs um north off um the escarpment and in, into georgian bay at wasaga uh beach and that watershed in particular uh, is very important. Lots of headwater streams, lots of cold water streams. Uh, cold water streams are, are um, um, very important because they, they support uh, specific species of fish, uh, particularly trout, which fishermen like, uh, and they're easily disrupted and, and easily damaged. And what I was gonna mention was headwaters are very important because uh, if you protect the headwaters, the downstream benefits are maximized. If you protect the mouth of a river, well, the downstream benefits uh, kind of flow into Lake Ontario. But if you protect the headwaters, you know everybody downstream benefits. And so uh, those, those upstream headwaters um, uh, are part of the Blue Belt vision. Uh, Anastasia, you may have more information, but that's kind of what what uh, is top of mind for me. Yeah, Anastasia, I think you put a link in there. So is that where people can get more information on the Blue Belt? Yes. Okay. Blue Belt maps, as Dave said, absolutely created for the last consultation because the, the consultation was about protecting the Green Belt for water, for protecting water for future generations. So um, in that consultation, a lot of energy was put into design, like just sorting out where that could be because the questions were quite open-ended then too. Okay, that's fantastic. And Dave, I, I know you gave a few examples of uh, creatures that you see in the in your backyard versus what you see in the in the um, in the green belt or in the ravine system. And uh, one of the things that really blew me away because we worked on uh, the establishment of Rouge National Urban Park was just how many species are in there. Um, I, I know that it's over two thousand in the green belt uh, and area. Uh, you know, Rouge, et cetera, the Moraines. And, and that just to me is an astounding kind of uh, piece of information that we have so many species that we're coexisting with and, and that uh, 
rely on this habitat as their homes and that we have a, a trust to make sure that it happens. But those, those species are really very, very different. They're plants and animals and birds. And uh, I mean, we've, uh, we've personally seen otters and we've seen, uh, what is it, mink? All kinds of things that we've seen in there. Um, and just it's just a fascinating ecosystem to be part of and to be uh, enriched by. And maybe, I don't know if you have anything else to say on the number of creatures that are in the in the green belt and, and further. Um, well, you mentioned that uh, we're a biodiversity hotspot, basically yeah. for Canada. So highest, uh, highest amongst the highest number of species in, in the whole country, but also the highest um, uh, number of species at risk because of the right. population pressures. Um, so we really have a, um, a huge opportunity to do things right. And if we don't do it now, um, as we've seen, like population pressures and development pressures are just growing and we need to really seize the opportunity and, and, uh, and realize it. Yeah. Great. Um, I have another question. Uh, would other provincial changes like um, ZOs or the passage of Bill 257, for example, um, would they have any opportunity to, or be able to circumvent the future of uh, Greenbelt protections or our current Greenbelt protections? Uh, Susie, I think that's, we're kicking it over to you there. <laughs> the, um, so the land use planning framework is complicated. And what I can tell you is that it certainly is the case and was the case before that uh, it's possible to use a ministry zoning order uh, to, uh, to propose zoning from the minister's level and do that quickly uh, in uh, favor of a provincial interest. What we've seen is um, much, much greater use of that tool. And the frustration for communities can be that the minister's zoning order uh, does not have any opportunities for public comment. It can't be appealed, like it, uh, the kinds of decisions that your local municipality would make, where there's very clear public consultation opportunities and then uh, appeal provisions. Uh, so that can be frustrating. The what. What I know about um, what the law says is that uh, ministers zoning orders under the Planning Act, they, these, uh, there's been some new provisions that say um, that the minister can do more than just zone, but can kind of start doing uh, site plans and more detailed zoning, uh, but that is, it, explicitly not allowed in the Greenbelt area under the Planning Act. Then um, there's also these new uh, provisions that are proposed in the bill you mentioned, um, where uh, it's about whether or not the minister's zoning orders have to be consistent with the provincial policy statement. And the proposed uh, amendments will say that the minister's zoning orders, uh, not only do they not, but they never had to be consistent with provincial policy statements. And, um, and this, uh, this whole way in which uh, those powers are being exercised in, in some ways looks um, to be detrimental to the kinds of protections. I can say that this government commits over and over and over again that they, do, they will not use these powers in the green belt, um, so it it really depends whether or not where the zoning is desired to be changed is in the green belt protected countryside or not. Mm -hmm. So you've probably heard a lot about a particular minister's zoning order and a wetland in Pickering. Um, that wetland uh, is private land, so it is is it like the. Um, the urban river valley is protected, but only the public land. So it's tricky, uh, and um, and I know for many communities, very frustrating. Yeah, thanks, Anastasia. I think that uh, you've just demonstrated how complex it is, and sometimes it's not a it's not a clear vision of how things are. But one thing I do know uh, that we've experienced over this past number of years that the that the the this provincial government is has responded to uh, public interest. 
uh, where public interest has been displayed, there's, uh, you know, in, on occasions, there's been some, some real responses, right? So, so that's why we are encouraging everybody to get uh, as, as many uh, submissions as they can in so that uh, the government will really understand the, the depth of passion that there is around the green belt, the need to expand it. And while, the, as Dave highlighted, that the population from our perspective, as population pressures increase, the green belt has never been more important and expansion of the green belt is yeah, equally as important. And it's a generational change that we're looking for this kind of expansion. And we're very pleased that this government is at least having the, the consultation and getting this out there because this is how we can have the voice of the people heard. So if you have any hesitation, we really are asking you to make sure you put your submissions in and get them in there. You'll find more information on our website we will be sending out all the details for that and all of the resource materials that Anastasia has provided as well. So um, are there any final questions, Eugenia? No? Okay, well, I am actually going to thank each and every one of you for participating. Thank you, Eugenia, for making the event seamless as usual. And Dave, thank you so much for all of uh, the materials that you brought today. In particular, I'm really glad that you highlighted the blue belt. I had not really um, thought so much about that. So I'm really happy to have learned a little bit more about that. And Anastasia, as always, I learned so much when you do your presentations and it was really good to get a recap, even though I lived through all of that, I still still wasn't able to kind of follow the, you know, sort of understand all the bouncing balls that uh, went into it. So it was really good. And we're very, very pleased and and lucky to have, have you on this webinar. So thank you all to all of you who attended and um, I hope to see your submissions going through our portal and, uh, and helping influence uh, government process and expand the green belt. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.